So a very warm welcome to our next speaker, um, David Berman from Queen Mary's, who's telling us about extended field theories. Thank you, David. Yeah, okay, so um, my understanding for this conference is it's sort of quite a broad set of interests and we're encouraged to do sort of overview talks. So I'm gonna do an introduction to extended field theories. And, and by that, I mean things which are sometimes called exceptional field theories or double field theory. Um, one minute, there we go. And to do that, I just need to give some context and motivation of why we would do this. And a good thing to think about is Kaluza Klein theory. So in Kaluza Klein theory, um, oh, I can't spell electromagnetism, we unify gravity and electromagnetism into a single geometric package where the action and local symmetries emerge from the reduction of a single geometric object in higher dimensions. Um, so this is something we're very used to. Now, when we have supergravity, we don't just have um, one form gauge potentials, we have two form or indeed uh, in more, in more generally P form potentials. And you, know, you could have asked this question a long time ago, is there a single geometric package whose reduction will give us gravity and P forms in lower dimensions? Now you can answer this question um, that with ordinary Riemannian geometry, you cannot. So if you want to get a two form uh, gauge theory, you can't get that from the reduction of ordinary gravity. But then you could turn this around and then say, could we find a theory that does this? And the theory that does this in terms of the NS2 form is so-called double field theory. And I'll explain how it does that in a moment. And then, so we have a theory that gets reduced, provides as ordinary gravity in a two form gauge theory. And then the local symmetries of that theory will be a combination of diffeomorphisms and the gauge transformations of the two forms. Now, I want to continue along this Kaluza Klein discussion because it provides us with an intuition, which I think is quite useful and interesting. So, this is not historically how it's developed, um, but it's an interesting perspective. If we uh, think of ordinary Kaluza Klein theory, then the massless states, the null states in the full theory, with momentum directed along the Kaluza Klein directions, these are things which give us mass and charge. Okay? And the mass is given by the momentum in the Kaluza Klein direction. And then the fact the mass is e equal to the charge is a BPS condition, which is naturally what happens with a null state. So um, that's in ordinary Kaluza Klein theory. And we'll see that that has an interesting implication in double field theory. Now we've seen this unification idea before, the null wave in M theory is the thing which gives us a D zero brain. The D zero brain momentum is, is, is the, the momentum mode in the 11th direction. And the BPS condition is just the mass being equal to the charge is the null state. Now here I've, I mean, I'll come back to these, but I just wanted to put up some specific solutions for later that we know what we're talking about. This is uh, when we talk about a wave, when we talk about a solution having momentum, this is a wave solution. So it has no gauge field, the dilaton is constant, and then we have H like this. So when you analyze the, um, the ADM momentum, then this is a wave uh, with momentum along the Z direction. Uh, this is the fundamental string. This obviously does have B field turned on, et cetera. Okay, so this is just so that we can see what we're talking about as things come up. Now, so this double field theory is where we're going to combine the metric, B mu nu, the two form potential, and the dilaton. Um, and we're going to do it to where we have some sort of geometric unification in, high, in some high dimensions. And along the way, we will have a manifest ODDR symmetry. And I'll discuss why this is an R and what the origin of this is later. Now, in order to make this work, what we need to do is actually double the dimension of space. 
So if D is the space that we want the metric in B field and Dilaton to live in, then we must have uh, a 2D dimensional space equipped with an ODD structure eta as follows. Okay, and then we will introduce new coordinates x tilde, which are D additional coordinates uh, along with the usual coordinates x mu. And then we're going to need what's something called a section condition, which is how we pick the D physical dimensions of space time inside this 2D dimensional space. And then, and then we will unify various concepts. We'll combine the metric and B field into a generalized metric. And the diffios engage transformations will form what's called generalized diffios, generated, generated by generalized Lie derivative. So here are double coordinates, uh, which we note x kit big M. And then we have this combination, which is the generalized metric first introduced by Hitchin which tells us how to combine G and B into a single metric. And then turns out to make things work, we need to rescale the dilaton as follows. This H, this generalized metric is actually a coset of ODD over OD cross OD. It's the thing that you get familiar with when you do T-duality, okay? Now, um, but that's some, generalized geometry. The new thing, uh, which was not present in Hitchin's work, is that we shouldn't need an action functional, um, which will then determine the equations of motion. And it cannot be the Einstein, it cannot be the Einstein, or rather uh, the Ricci scalar, it can't be the Einstein-Hilbert term for this metric, that won't work. So what you need is a generalized Ricci scalar which is given by the following equation. So this is um, a generalized Ricci scalar for the generalized metric H. So this is actually similar to the usual Ricci scalar, but these coefficients here are just different. Now, so this is um, the form of the action um, here, and then we have the degrees of freedom written in terms of this generalized metric. We can then analyze particular solutions. And the motivation here is given by that Kaluza Klein idea of momentum being associated to charged objects. So now what we do is we look at the DFT wave solution, which will be a solution of the equations of motion as derived from this action. Um, and also with a notion of generalized ADM momentum. And then, so this is, if you like, the generalized uh, PP wave solution in the doubled space. Okay, its property is null, carries momentum in the x tilde direction, and so it's like a null wave in DFT. Uh, it's also smeared over the additional dual directions, meaning in the harmonic function H, it has no dependence on the uh, x tilde direction. When we examine this from the point of view of the reduced theory, then what we get is the fundamental string extended along the z direction, okay? So, and then if we exchange z and z tilde, we get a PP wave in the z direction, which is sort of what I expected because waves and strings are PP all. So what's going on here is that strings in double field theory are actually null states with momentum along the uh, novel direction. Okay, so I mean, you know, this is something I've said again and again over the last X years. And I'm always intrigued by the people, you know, how much people take it to heart. It just says the fundamental string is a massless wave in the double space. That's a very different view of string theory that I think has not been sufficiently explored. Um, but anyway, so that was strings and two form gauge field, we can then look at the extension to M theory where we intend to make, uh, have all the, the host of P forms that exist in um, supergravities, that'd be all the Ramon Ramon sector lifted up to 11 dimensions. And the brains that will be relevant will not just be a fundamental string, but will be uh, things like um, membranes, fibrains, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay. So um, the thing that happens in M theory, and, and this is what the beginnings of exceptional field theory, is that with double field theory, you just need to double the number of dimensions to make this work. What happens now is it really depends on a case by case basis um, how many more dimensions you need to add. And I'll explain what I mean. So let's look at the let's look at um, five. Uh, sorry, it's actually for four dimensions. In four dimensions, the duality group is SL five. You should think of this as taking eleven-dimensional supergravity reduced to four dimensions. Okay, and then in a minute, say so why don't you just begin in eleven? I'll explain why when we get there. So you should think of SL five theory as being gravity plus a three-form. Uh, gauge theory in four dimensions. So I've got ordinary four dimensional quantum x mu. And then it turns out I need to introduce, and I'll explain why, six wrapping directions, y mu nu. That's the equivalent of the x tilde. Okay. Now, the reason for that is, in some sense, that's because the number of ways you can wrap a membrane in four dimensions is six ways. So, and that's what these coordinates are giving you. Um, and in another way is that you can ask, um, how do you form a representation of the duality group SL5? Well, you need, it is actually a 10. And so you actually need to add six to this four to get the 10 of SL5, which will form a representation of the duality group. So there are many ways to see this, but um, yeah. The, and then, the wave in the extended space, which previously gave us a string, now gives us a membrane. Uh, so we could write down the solutions before, and now what happens is that we have a null uh, wave, only now that's equivalent to the membrane, okay? And then we can go into other Girata groups. The next one up will be a spin or SO55. And then uh, the appropriate dimensional space is actually obviously 16. So XA here will be one to five. Maybe this will be membrane wrappings uh, here. And then there'd also be a fibrin wrapping. So as we go up in dimensions, more brains can wrap, which is why we don't have, and they wrap in different ways. So we don't just double the number of dimensions. You can see it gets quite complicated as more brains are allowed to wrap. And then we introduce coordinates associated to their winding modes and associated um, uh, generalized metrics, which I think I have an example of later. Okay, so now um, if we go back to this case, we can have a null wave pointing in this direction and that will give a five brain winding mode. But we might want to think a little bit more about um, if there's another way to view this. So let's go back to clue the Klein theory. There's a lot of intuition to be had from that. If you, when you have um, a magnetic monopole, uh, then that is basically when you take a non-trivial S1 over S2 in clue the Klein theory. So when we do clue the Klein theory, we've got an S1, and then you know we naively think that that is just globally uh, defined as a product. Well, you could do a bit more in Clues of Klein and then have that as a non-trivial vibration. And if you do that, then in the reduced Clues of Klein theory, you get a magnetic monopole. And if you do this in M theory, you'll get the D6. So now you can ask, can you do the same trick for DFT or these extended things where I have this extended space and rather than just have it as a, as a genuine global product space, have it as a non-trivial vibration. Okay, so we can do that. And then in DFT, if we then take our Kaluza Klein circle to the Z tilde and have a non-trivial vibration, then in the reduced theory, that actually is the NS5 brain. Now that shouldn't be a surprise to you because the NS5 brain is the magnetic jewel to the fundamental string. So then we can make the brain in uh, ordinary NS string theory or supergravity um, come about from having a non-trivial, essentially be the magnetic monopole uh, in DFT. And in the exceptional case, 
if I take a monopole whose Kaluza-Klein circle is the membrane winding, then that will produce the M5. And that shouldn't be a surprise because the M5 is the magnetic dual of the M2. Okay. And equally, the monopole whose Kaluza-Klein circle is the fibrane wrapping mode will be the M2 because the electromagnetic duality works both ways. Okay. And just to put again some equations down, um, this is indeed the magnetic monopole. This is the Kaluza-Klein monopole metric. And this describes how we have a vibration of one thing over another. So it's essentially using this metric, but choosing the directions in the generalized metric to be different. Okay, and then you get this host of, uh, so this is the example, and then you get this host of solutions. And um, yeah, good. Now, um, maybe I won't, well, Okay, let's move on from that. I won't do that. Now, we can ask, um, because this question comes up a lot at the time, is I said that the DFT generalized metric was an ODD coset, and that the action that I wrote down had an ODD R symmetry. But the important thing is that the ODD R symmetry in double field theory is not T duality. Okay. One would think that it is because ODD, you think of T duality, but that's not what it is. This is a continuous symmetry and it's a local symmetry. It actually comes from the combining of diffios and 2D uh, and two form gauge transformations. Okay. The section condition that restricts the dependence is, is a thing which then restricts the dependence of the fields, halves the number of dimensions. Now, this is the key point. You can solve that section condition in different ways. So if there are no isometries, you actually have no choice. Um, let's say we're in 10 dimensions. The double theory has got 20 dimensions. Um, if there are no isometries in the 10, you obviously have to choose the 10 dimensions where all the fields depend as your space time. But now, if there are some isometries, then there's not a canonical choice of half the dimension embedded in the total space. Because if there's an isometry, let's say in the Z direction, it doesn't depend on Z or Z tilde. So the choice of what you call space time inside this bigger space is ambiguous. That is what T duality is. It's an ambiguity in how you embed and what you call to be physical space time inside the much bigger uh inside the much bigger space okay now um we can go on and discuss how we can use this to come up with various corrections but i, I won't perhaps concentrate on this in this review okay so what we've said so far is that in dft and other extended exceptional geometries waves with momentum are strings or brains, and that the monopoles in those theory are the S joules, which gives us other brains of different dimensions. Thus, all brains in exceptional geometries are simultaneously waves and monopoles. Okay, now, um, you can ask, given one of those solutions, does this pick a duality frame? Okay, because it's one solution in, uh, it's just one solution in the, in the exceptional field theory or DFT. So let's look at what happens with normal S1 compactifications. Okay. The duality frame that you pick is normally given by the energy or coupling associated to it. So it really simple thing. If we've got very large radius of the S1, we normally choose a normal momentum frame because that's the low energy description. If we have a very small circle compared to the string scale, then we choose the winding mode frame. So the natural frame that you choose to pick is given by what is an appropriate low energy description. Okay. If we have R of the order of the string length, then there's no natural frame. 
So now you can say, what about the solutions that I've just given in DFT? Okay. So at infinity, for the description of the F1 fundamental string or the null wave, we've got a complete ambiguity from infinity of whether it's a string or a wave, okay? But as you go to the core of the solution, then in fact, um, it's, it looks like a wave in the twisted space. In other words, uh, as you go into the core of the solution, you need to diagonalize in order to say which directions are large. Um, and then when you do that, you see that actually uh, there's a, there is a duality frame and it will look like a wave. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing that is that PP waves don't have singularities. Fundamental strings appear to. So that's a statement that is duality, well, sorry, frame dependent that can change with your duality frame. And in DFT, one sees directly through the calculation that the core of the fundamental string is non-singular and a particular duality frame is picked out. Okay. Now, um, in the full exceptional field theory, um, the, first I should say the full non-truncated one was developed by Hohmann Sandleben. In this theory, the brains must be simultaneously waves and monopoles. The reason for that is that, um, let's go back to this case of an M5 brain. It was given by a monopole of the M2 winding direction, or it was given by a momentum mode in the five brain winding direction. So the solution really has to be both of those. And in fact, there is a self-duality condition that relates both of those. So in fact, the solution that you have when you go through the equations of motion for exceptional field theory is that it's a self-dual solution um, and that this single self-dual solution will cover all the half BPS brains of 11-dimensional supergravity. So for those, anyone who's worked on um, things like N equals two Yang Mills, you know that there's a very important role played by the self-dual string in the, in the M theory lift to six dimensions. Um, and this is a gravitational version of that. Okay. Now, uh, let me give some of the equations behind this. And I'm gonna work in a particular theory. This is the E7 now exceptional field theory. And here it turns out you have a 56 dimensional representation. This is 56. This dx4 here is just the standard space that goes along with it. Um, and this m is the generalized metric and f is the field strength, uh, which takes values also in E7. And it's the equation of motion, this object that you have to solve to get the solutions that I'm describing. And uh, okay, so this is the potential of that thing before. And I should say this also is shown Simon's term. Now, the self duality equation I was referring to is, the, is this thing. Okay, so it's uh, this M is an E7 index. Um, omega is an E7 invariant. Uh, M is this generalized metric in the E7 generalized space. And then, so this is a self duality equation. And it turns out all the brains in supergravity will obey this thing. And uh, okay, so we can find solutions and I'm just gonna write them out here for you. And the key point is that, that we have to pick a direction in the E7 space, which I've given here by this vector little a m. Once we do that, there's a dual vector that is determined through the equations of motion a m tilde. Um, and then this ansatz will solve and give you a self-dual equation to this thing here. And then when you do that, um, you'll get all the half BPS brains, the solution of this single equation. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna give some more details. This then is the generalized metric uh, combined with the usual metric, a la Kaluza and Klein. And then when you look at that, yeah, okay, this is the solution. 
And uh, in fact, for the particular case, it simplifies where you then have one block, which is like a wave and another block, which is like a monopole. Okay, this and all determined by this harmonic function. Now, at infinity, the harmonic function will be one, and the solution therefore is equally wave and monopole. But as R goes into zero, the wave dominates again. So the core of the solution again becomes like a wave. Okay, and this is true for all the brains in supergravity. Uh, we'll go through this bit again. Okay, I think just in the last few minutes, um, I'm just going to describe how you can extend this uh, further to what's called exotic brains. Uh, actually, how, many, how much time have I got left? You've got about 10 minutes at least. So oh, okay. Loads of time. Right. Okay. So, so far what I've done is describe um, ordinary brains and I've described them in a kaluza klein setting and um, by embedding everything in this bigger space. Now, through duality chains, it's been known for a long time that there are these things called exotic brains in string theory. Now, a key point of an exotic brain is that it has um, fluxes that come from having non-trivial um, vibrations, um, sorry, not vibrations, non-trivial monodromies under the duality group, okay? So this was first explored by Shelton, Taylor, and Vecht. And what they showed is if you started with something which had H flux, this is H, the usual flux associated to the B field. If you did T dualization, you get something that's what's called geometric flux. So this will be um, a monopole, um, meaning um, the non-trivial geometric vibration of the type I described before. And then if you keep on going, you get something called Q-flux, which has no uh, analogy from before. It's just something that comes about when you T-dualize this geometric flux, and you can go again and get something called R-flux. So these fluxes are associated to T-dualizing um, known fluxes, which is H is the usual flux associated to B. F is the flux associated to geometry. Um, if you want technically what that would be, you could get that from finding the commutator of the verbines, for example. And you get these things called Q and R flux. And then they will give you a non-trivial monodromy. They will measure something with a non-trivial monodromy. Uh, under T-duality, and that's the origin of an exotic brain. Now, in, um, here we go. So this is basically what I've just said here. Um, and now in DFT, in double field theory, what you can then do is um, view these things as being less exotic, but just doing the same sort of thing but involving these novel winding directions. So let's just go through this. So F, the geometric flux, as it's called, is actually just a twisted torus. What that means is it's a circle fibered over a T2, uh, non-trivially. So you have a T2 base, and then you twist a circle around it, and then you will generate something with F, geometric flux, as it's called. Now, if I do the same thing, but swap the usual circle with one of the novel winding directions, X tilde as the fiber, then I will get H flux. So all I've done is swap, um, this is purely geometric and I've got a non-trivial vibration. And now I just take X tilde being the fiber and make that non-trivial. And, and I'll get some H flux. Now, Q flux is when we mix both the winding and normal directions as a fiber. Okay, so it's more like having um, where you can have a circle and then have a T2 made up of X and X tilde. And the R flux is where the base and the fiber are all winding directions. So this flux can't exist um, in usual string theory 
because it relies on having non-trivial dependence on winding directions, which normally we don't have. But we know brains with R-flux exist through following a whole load of the neutrality chain. And uh, now in EFT, this gets even bigger because that was what, where these things were just in ordinary string theory and where we just had um, the exotic directions were just X tilde mu. Now we go and we have all sorts of weirdly exotic things with more and more exotic indices because we can wind, for example, a membrane winding non-trivially fiber around the torus or a five brain winding non-trivially wrapped around and so on, or make the base out of winding. And you get this enormous growth of possibilities for exotic brains, all of which come about as vibrations of exotic dimensions around others. Okay. So there's a whole challenge in various papers on this of, of explicitly constructing exotic brains as vibrations involving this winding space. And, uh, okay. Here is an example of one that we constructed my uh, student Ryo Otsuki a while ago. It, I don't know what you meant to get from that other than it exists. So the solutions found by, by Debor and Shigamori um, are exactly written here in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of this metric here in the extended space within which and the key point on it has a non-trivial vibration. So there's a now, yeah, a whole host of brains all come about from saying, how do we fiber these non-trivial um, exotic dimensions above the usual space? Okay, uh, boom, 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 first more solutions. I think the best thing is, uh, I'll summarize, which is um, in double field theory, exceptional field theory, what we're doing is generating the p-form uh, gauge theory, part of supergravity from higher dimensions, and then looking at a reduced theory of an exotic geometric theory in the higher dimensions. And then the brains become either waves or they are monopoles of a certain type. And then we can also have more exotic objects as we consider different non-trivial vibrations of these exotic dimensions. And then this gives us a very different way to think about string theory. And whether that's useful, we'll wait and see. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Professor. Um, very interesting, slightly different perspective of everything. Um, are there any questions? We've got plenty of time for questions. Everyone believes strings are waves in dimensions now. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Yeah, very interesting. Can I, can I ask a question? Please do. Yes, sure, Andre. Um, can you comment on the role of supersymmetry? I mean, th those brains are BPS brains in the regular supergravities, but what about supersymmetry in those extended or exceptional fields? Yeah. Theory? Right, so um, I didn't put it in these slides, but you can make everything super symmetric. Now, how, how does this work when you extend the number of dimensions? It's because the what all of these things uh, are are coset spaces, G over H, where H is where the uh, fermions live. Okay, so when you go through the Dirac groups and what those coset metrics are. Um, then all of those H's admit fermion representation. So you can make, uh, so you can make all of these theories supersymmetric. Um, and then, you know, it, it's things that, you know, a null in ordinary supersymmetry. So I should say supersymmetric with no central charges. Okay. But the momentum that you would put uh, so it's so normally, you know, you'd write down something like Q, Q is equal to P, but the P would include momentum in these exotic directions. And the momentum in those exotic directions is just like the central charge. Um, so, yeah. And then being half BPS would be just like being null, as you have 
So normally you'd have a null thing, you'd have mass being equal to central charge. And now that just becomes P naught being equal to um, P X tilde, which is a null condition. Okay, so it's the fact that null things are also half BPS when you have no central charges. I guess I guess what I'm confused about is that the number of dimensions is large, so it should be an absolutely enormous supersymmetry. In, in no, those... um, yeah, yeah. I it's so the thing to realize is why I said is that um, you still have the same supersymmetry in the end, even though you're going up. And the oh. reason for that is, as I say, it's because it's g over h. So um, yeah, I should have I should have written a slide with all of these things. In, so the, yes. the spinners are still spinners in the lower dimensional space. Exactly, the spinners are still spinners in H. Uh -huh. That's the point. Okay, that that's that's the crucial point. Um, the, uh, you can even think of it in ODD as a really simple example. Um, the the generalized metric is a coset of ODD over OD cross OD. Mm -hmm. So it's actually just. OD cross OD is just type two spinners in, in D dimensions, not a spinner of, of 2D. Mm -hmm. And so okay. next time you ever see a duality coset list, which people put up on slides, just notice that the G over H, the H, all form nice spinner representations mm. that don't blow up. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I can't see any in the chat. So if there aren't any more, then let's thank uh, Professor Berman again uh, for a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Thank you also to all the other speakers from this session, um, as well as the organizers. Thank you, Ed, um, for playing that talk earlier. I think we're just breaking for about an hour now and reconvening for uh, John Hauenstein's talk in about an hour. Uh, is there any, are there any other comments from Ed or Young?